Christopher. So um, why don't we get started? Um, so today, I, um, we, I suppose initially, we, we were wanting to make a um, continuing on this idea of charting a course. Again, we're, we're interested in people who are practicing in ways that maybe um, move a little bit outside the typical um, parameters of architectural practice. Um, and also interested in people who post graduation would go on and take interesting paths. And I suppose our two presenters today reflect um, different aspects of that. Um, so, in the first lead, we're going to hear from Alan Meredith, who's a graduate of UCD. Now, I'm going to attempt a year. I'd say 2013. 2015. Oh, okay. All right. So, a, a young, a recent graduate of ours. Uh, who, 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 who's since gone on to practice largely in the field, well, no, uh, across a range of scales may, of making from furniture to much larger scale installations. And then we have Stephen Tierney, who's a design fellow in the school, has taught in the school for a long time uh, now, and <clears throat> also uh, sustains an architectural practice that works across a number of scales, including built projects, but also um, an interest in furniture, furniture design, so actually uh, photography which I don't think he's going to talk about today. In fact, I'm told that the common theme that will emerge is a shared interest in oak. So um, what we're going to do is we'll have Alan will talk first for uh, talk a bit about some of his work and then we'll go to Stephen and then we'll come together uh, for questions <coughs> and conversation following the two presentations. If there's if there's if you have immediate questions, uh, drop them into the chat and we can pick them up maybe after, you know, Alan's talk or Stephen's talk, but do uh, feel free to drop questions, comments into the chat as we go. Um, as usual, recording this and this will also be going out on YouTube channel within about a day or so. But Alan, can we um, go to you first? And thank you very much for joining us this this lunch time. I look forward to hearing. Thank you very much, Hugh, and thanks for the invite, guys, and thanks for everyone that's tuning in. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to launch straight in and talk about. Um, I suppose my work since graduating. Um, so I'll just share the screen here and get it going. So um, I suppose just to give you a bit of context to, to, what, um, to what I do now um, and, and how it kind of started. So when I was studying in UCD, so I did three years plus two years of the master's program finishing in 2015. And um, at the same time as studying, I was also um, always making and um, primarily with wood. Um, and across a couple of, of disciplines, kind of established disciplines that there's a little world of people who work within those disciplines in Ireland who maybe I was in contact with and um, was learning from at that time. So throughout my studies, I would have spent my summer holidays or any spare time I had uh, working on these projects kind of on the side. And it would have stemmed from, say, um, secondary school and interests I would have had at that time. So I suppose the first strand of that would be wood turning. And this is a piece I made in 2013 um, called Containment. And it was a set of nine vessels made in nine Irish-grown hardwoods. And the idea was to show the, the variation, the subtle variations between the different uh, materials in terms of the way that they distort when the wood dries, but also in terms of the colours. And I suppose taking a very simple idea and then how that could have through the subtleties of the, the different materials that the piece would find its expression. So that's a kind of an early piece, 2013 wood turning. Um, I remember my Easter holidays of first year in UCD, um, I made a chair. Um, this was the design that then developed, I suppose, over the years. This is a chair I still make um, and will be making at the minute, make, make numbers every year, um, maybe between 20 and, and 40 per year for different projects. Um, and it's developed and developed. It's probably at a stage now that we're not looking to develop it anymore, maybe looking to de develop how it's made um, in a more efficient manner, but the design is kind of set. But it started in 2010. And at the same time as I graduated um, in 2015, I was working on a project, a public art project for New Park Comprehensive School in Black Rock. And that was um, 
I suppose on the larger side of things, more architectural, it was about social space, about people engaging um, with the work and being within the work and using it every day and trying to create, I suppose, kind of like a, a place-making uh, intervention for, for the school. Um, and, and then for my thesis, this was part of my thesis project, which was looking at using um, roadside trees, urban forestry, the material that was available from those sort of trees when they were cut down or came to the end of their life and how that might be used to um, make uh, useful things for, say, the city. Um, so the, an example I used for this uh, was this deck, which was made from pieces of wood that were all one meter long and interlocked to make uh, a larger structure. Uh, and it was in, it was in the quad in, in UCD was where it was installed first. And so, uh, after that, it had some um, life beyond in pop-up uh, music festivals um, and such. So the first project I want to talk about then is a school project for Port Leash, uh, the Holy Family Schools. It's a percent for our commission uh, curated by Ashling Pryor. I was invited a shortlist of five, I think, artists and uh, there was a site visit and we were invited to submit an idea. So uh, during the site visit, this was the, what we were confronted with. It was a school, they had a, a percent for art budget and they were looking for a proposal. So there was this central space which we were kind of uh, guided towards as the place that needed something um, in order to, to brighten it up a bit and to bring a bit of life to that center of the school. So it was a big co concrete expanse, um, not very appealing or welcoming. Um, on the out and so this new school was on a greenfield site on the outskirts the skirts of Port Leash on a ring road. Um, the schools, the original schools, there was maybe three schools that had been brought together, brought to this new site, and they were being taken from the center of the town. So Port Leash is a town with a main street and a market square that's now a car park. And the schools were really all that was left on the near the main street, at least a lot of the shops had already moved out to the outskirts, new Tesco, Dunn stores and butchers, everything then moves with them. And um, so the, the middle of Port Leash is really um, not in a good place. It's, there's plans at the minute to, to do things, but it, probably not um, not in, in a really good place at the minute. It's, it's, it's starting to decay. Um, without something being done soon, that uh, there's serious problems down the line. So I suppose I was interested in how the, sc the school on the outskirts of the town also then um, was taking away from that center of the town in a way. So um, again, that this big concrete expanse, you can see here, this is the entrance into the school, a pretty typical kind of um, new, school in Ireland, I would say, in terms of the use of materials and the forms. Um, this is the site plan. Uh, looking at, at that school again, there's a, a roundabout, which you can see to the bottom of that drawing, to the, the west, um, and then the central area in the middle, which is the concrete. So looking at the town of Port Leash, um, then I guess I was interested in how it had developed. Um, and I suppose at one time, there was a main street in the central square with all the roadways leading towards a central point. And over recent years, kind of in the last maybe 40 to 50 years, a lot of housing estates have developed in the outskirts. And they relate to it becoming a commuter town, which then had something to do with the school and the school expanding and the people who were in the school not necessarily being... Um, not, not always from Port Leash. A lot of people would have moved to Port Leash. And then the parents of the students would be, a lot of them would be moving or living in Port Leash and then traveling to Dublin or traveling outside of Leash in order to go to school. So there was this strange thing about the town that once was about lots of roads leading to a center point, which then um, in a way was mirrored through the, the types of people and the parents um, of the students that were in the school, that there were people that had come from other places or there were people who were from Port Leash that traveled to other places. So it was a coming and going, um, which um, was quite evident and was something actually the, the school had asked for in terms of 
something that reflected the town of Port Leash and that idea of it being somewhere that people can come and go from. So uh, I suppose in terms of trying to come up with a concept, I, I knew I wanted to make a social space, something people could interact with, but the form that that was going to take then, um, I suppose my approach, which um, is one of trying to find the form um, and, and the form being something that's very important as an endpoint, but trying to find the form through an investigation of the characteristics of whatever it is, whether it's a chair or material that we're looking at, or in this case, a place, that the form could emerge from the, from the analysis. Um, and I guess that's something maybe that I probably learned um, in in UCD, it was a, an idea as opposed to maybe something that how furniture maybe is typically designed or how sculptures are typically designed, but the, the, the analysis being an important part of the whole process. Um, so looking at the, end, just at the Google map of Port Leash from um, it was 2018 around that time, I'm not sure if the ring roads are fully, they're, they're more complete at this stage and looking at the, <clears throat> you can see the red lines here, the um, the bits of the road then that leads to the center point and they were all coming from different places and that having a geometry which I suppose had got to do with with landscape and um, different functions over the years and the road network would have developed so it was interesting and that has a shape um, and how that could possibly be useful as a way of making a social space so uh, in that shape and it developing further and then placing that shape on the site and seeing would that be a useful um, form for a place for people to meet. So then just looking at how that developed um, and it was, I suppose, finding an appropriate scale, deciding what material it was going to be made out of, and then I'll just go run through some nice images. These are by Steve Murray from a drone um, of the piece in the place. So it's made from uh, Irish oak. I think there's about six tons of Irish oak, um, green oak, and then metal planters with planting. And the planting um, was designed by Nicola Haynes Stevens wife um, and the ideas, I suppose, with a bit of to and fro um, and discussions with her about that, I was trying to create planting that would be nice for the students to interact with, would seasonally give some interest and colour and smell and would be educational in a way and also safe um, for, for students to be in close contact with. And the final piece then in position, this is at um, the end of the school day, teachers coming in to meet, or sorry, uh, parents coming in to collect their, their children and interacting with the piece and I suppose finding some rest, but it also being something about a, an identifier for the school and, a, and about placemaking and um, uh, was trying to add to the identity of the place and create a piece that was of the place. Um, I suppose my initial feeling was that this school being on a greenfield site, um, that the material character really had, it could have been anywhere. Uh, it had no real connection um, with, the, with the landscape or, or, or Port Leash. Um, so that's... The piece then in the context, you can see that it's just really on waste ground um, on the outskirts, lots of housing estates, the ring road. And then I suppose uh, on a smaller scale, it was about the detail of the piece, about the oak and the metal benches and the, how they might be detailed in such a way that they would create interest and <clears throat> play with shadow and light. And then also carving the oak and showing the depth of the material by making deep cuts into the oak that it somehow would show the, the solidity and the, the depth of material. And you can see um, some students interacting and then the planting, um, working with the different colors 
different planting was selected for different areas. So each planter was a different color and had a different um, plant or grass. And they would change throughout the years and that how the metal work and the steel work would, would tie in together. And then shadow um, and, how, and light would play with that throughout the times of the day. So, so that's the piece installed and, uh, and in use. And I think um, I, was, I was there at lunchtime. It seems to be quite successful as a functional thing, but also as a, from an artistic point of view in the commentary of um, Port Leash as a place. I think that's kind of something that has translated and especially is understood. And it's, a, it's fun to, to, be, for, to be looked at, even from a child's point of view, as a map of Port Leash, but then on a, on a more sophisticated level, it also has um, meaning. So I just want to run through quickly some of the, I just I give a feeling of the making of, the, of a piece like that. Um, this is the oak arriving at my workshop. This is my dog, Benny, inspecting it. Um, the slabs are big rectangles. Everything was drawn on a computer before it was, um, I suppose, as, as it was designed, and then the, the slabs came to dimensions to what I needed from the computer output, and then that allowed me then to, to shape the pieces accurately. Um, this one of the guys in the workshop uh, carving the different angles. There were a couple of chainsaw first. This is one of the finished benches, uh, angled uh, and themed. These are the steel planters then in the spray shop. Um, so just to give you a feel maybe of, of the main and the day-to-day -day kind of life of what I, what I was at at this time, going to the workshops, uh, those some issues with colors and stuff, dealing with, with all those things and the, the advantages, I suppose, of understanding the processes um, by being on the ground. And then obviously there's, there's challenges as well. The planters arrive at my studio and they're matched with the benches. We make sure everything is, is good to go. And then once it's delivered on site at all, fitted together nicely. The ground here was sloping, so everything had to be um, worked uh, to match that to the top of everything. The top of the benches and the top of the planters is one level plane, while the underside is adjusted to match the contours of the ground, meaning that some of the benches will be 350 millimeters off the ground, which is maybe a junior infant child sitting down, whereas the benches down near the, the water channel would be 450, 475 high, which is a grown adult bench height. So that would that kind of worked out nicely, but it, it made a technical challenge, I suppose, of the making process. So moving on then from that project, I just want to talk briefly about some other projects which I have done for architects, um, very often related to, say, my time in UCD or people that were working in um, I suppose friends of mine from UCD who end up working in practices who needed things made and they were aware of what I was doing and, and through one thing and another I got involved in projects with architects which was, has, has been a very rewarding aspect of my work um, to be able to stay kind of in the architecture loop um, and, and talk to people who have lots of ideas and are all generally um, I suppose um, generous with their um, critique and, and guidance on my own projects or the work I've been doing. And I found that very beneficial um, since leaving, say, over the last five years, having had lots of contact, maybe one or two different architects every year, been working with them on projects. It's been um, quite beneficial, I think, for my own, my own work. So this is um, not the Nine Lives um, exhibition in the National Craft Gallery in Kilkenny, and the, um, that exhibition was curated by Emmett Scanlon. And so he, I was brought on board to make the, the installation for this, displaying the work. So that was 2015. Um, this is a project with um, Tierney Haynes Architects and UCD, which was a project for Bloom in the park. And it, I suppose it, it it showed the course of the evolution of plants um, from when the earth was just rocks and 
and sand to uh, algae growth to ferns and right up to modern day farming. So the evolution of plant growth on, on earth and it's actually used to be in the science and um, the science block at the minute um, permanently. So this piece was in bloom in 2016 and then was moved to UCD at a later stage. Um, this project then is with A2 Architects and it was a pop-up bench for the summer of 2017. And this is it outside the Lexington Library in Dunleary. Um, it, it was a, a it had to be a mobile bench, so it moved to Marley Park, uh, Cabin Teeley Park, and it's currently in, um, I think it's San, maybe Stillorgan Industrial Estate. Or I'm not quite sure, but it's a, a permanent, kind of semi-permanent now. In, in, uh, where it is, but it, it moved for the summer and it was um, very successful actually um, in terms of the, the community engagement with the piece. And again, with A2 Architects, this was for the Venice Biennale in 2018 for Close Encounter. They were invited to be part of the Close Encounter um, exhibition, and I was responsible for making their installation along with Boyd Cody's piece which was based on the architecture of Eileen Gray so this model is of one of our houses and um, an abstract interpretation describing some of the properties and um, it's actually a clock as well as a model and I suppose most recently this is a model which I made for Grafton Architects for their competition winning entry for the University of Arkansas. Uh, it's an oak model um, showing the structure of, of that building. And then uh, briefly, I just want to go through a series of furniture, which I have developed, I suppose, in the last three to four years, which is looking uh, in, in an intimate way at oak and ash, Irish oak and Irish ash, and how it can be manipulated into uh, furniture forms that are functional while trying to exploit the potential of the material and its ability to be steamed and then reshaped into new, into new forms. So this shelf um, is made from one single plank of Irish oak. And once it's steamed, it's been um, it's been bent back on itself, and uh, I suppose it, there's a, a technique and a jig and a, a setup for 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 this technique that we've developed. And once the timber and the oak is dry, it then stays in the new shape. So this this concept has been developed in a number of ways uh, through different. Um, different furniture pieces, different functions. So in this case, it's a shelf. Here, it's a console table. So it's two planks of oak, steam bent, joined together, carved. Um, and allow it, the idea in this case would be that the tabletop and the table surface are the one piece of wood. So structure and surface become the one, the one thing, which in a traditional table, very often they're separated. You've got a, a leg and a rail joint and then a tabletop. Whereas in this case, the two are combined and the, the technique of steam bending and, and, bend, and bending the, the wood allows, allows, I suppose there, there's no need for any joint then because the, because the wood bends around the corner. Uh, and then developing on that project uh, further, this is a steam bent table, a dining table, um, the grain actually runs around this piece, which means that you get an interesting uh, center detail because wood needs to be able to move. So by allowing the grain to run around the piece, there's a, an issue which would prevent the wood from moving in and out as the seasons and the, the temperature changes. So by creating this uh, central joint detail, that allows the wood to move and creates some intrigue at the center of the table. And then re more recently, this is made into a 18 seater dining table with chairs for a private house in Dublin. 
uh, again for a uh, private house in Dublin, another iteration of the steam bent work, this time in ash, um, using a slightly different uh, uh, leg to tabletop detail, where the, we use two layers of ash and they're joined together, and that creates incredible strength at the critical point where the top becomes the, the leg. Sorry about that now. The, again, a, a console table in Irish oak, scorched oak, and with a drawer detail in this case, also in oak, but not scorched really, so that the material quality and the color is, I suppose, is restrained on the outside. And then once the piece opens, you get to see the the natural oak with and there's a leather detail in this case as well and again uh, another console in fumed oak with a set of my vessels which is from another series of turned work which also uses its wood turning and steam bending combined to create these pieces which um are, i suppose in terms of their form are quite original and they're about pushing the material again into new shapes that's those three vessels again, steam bent Irish oak. First they're turned, hollowed on a wood turning lathe. Um, and I suppose all those pieces, the, the idea usually comes from an interaction with the material about engaging with the material, making pieces trial and error and being active um, with the material. And so that's where I'd like to leave it. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay <laughs> to leave it there. I think it's good to finish on a picture of you uh, working with the material. This was one of the most obvious things to say about your practice is that you make everything you design and vice versa, but in a way that might, you know, that, very, that departs, I guess, from the usual module, model of architectural practice. You, you showed your seemingly endlessly uh, capacious workshops which can accommodate everything from these small scale uh, pieces of furniture and vessels to much larger uh, public art commissions so i mean that's something that we might pick up on uh, in the conversation just you know at what point that became clear that that was going to be your way of practicing um Alan, I might just, if it's okay, we might just go straight to Stephen's, unless there's urgent questions coming through the chat, we might go straight to Stephen, because I think um, we've already heard mention um, <coughs> of his partner and the work with Alan. So it might make sense for Stephen to go to you, and then we'll have oh. a, con a conversation afterwards. So, Alan, would you mind sh stop sharing your screen, and then we can get Stephen going. Okay. Okay, you see that? Yeah. Yep, good stuff. <clears throat> uh, well, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of uh, working with Alan for a few years. Um, uh, I taught Alan in fourth year back in 2013, I think, where he did a fabulous project that I'll never forget, which was the IKEA chair. Where, I remember that, Alan, where you, you took a chair from IKEA, you assembled it just as it would have come out of its flat pack, and then you made a good example of it. You had the two beside each other, and it was amazing to see how the quality of one so stood out against the flat pack nature of the other. And so um, Alan has been um, a great collaborator on a variety of furniture and uh, landscape design projects. Um, so our common interest, oak, uh, I'd like to talk about, okay, you can see that? Yeah. Yep, good stuff. <clears throat> uh, well, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of uh, working with Alan for a few years. Um, uh, I taught Alan in fourth year back in 2013, I think, where he did a fabulous project that I'll never forget, which was the IKEA chair. Where I remember that Alan, where you you took a chair from IKEA, you assembled it just as it would have come out of its flat pack, and then you made a good example of it. You had the two beside each other, and it was amazing to see how the quality of one so stood out against the flat pack nature of the other. And so um, Alan has been um, a great collaborator on a variety of furniture and uh, landscape design projects. Um, so our common interest, Oak, uh, I'd like to talk about two um, houses that I worked on that are, I suppose, intimately connected with Oak. 
And the first one is this one in Suffolk in England. Um, I studied architecture in England and then worked there for, for quite a few years. And my third job after graduating, I worked with James Gorst Architects and it was really in its deep end. Um, this was my case study for my part three. And um, it was a house in the middle of Suffolk, uh, rural. It was taught at the time when we started to be some part of it to be 18th century. It was a protected structure. Um, but it, uh, it, um, just a second, sorry. Um, it looked like that. So it was largely 60s and 70s additions to it with uh, PVC windows, with uh, a cement render. It was pretty uh, unpromising. And um, it was only when things started coming off, the older extensions started to reveal itself as being something much, much older. Um, and so when we took off the, uh, of the kind of 60s and 70s extensions, it revealed itself to have this kind of uh, old core. And the old core, uh, the left part, the right hand part was the extension that we proposed. The left part dated right back, some of it, to the 1440s, which is, is really, really old. That's pre-Tudor, that's Plantagenet, um, truly ancient. And um, something that we don't actually have in Ireland at all. We don't have any uh, timber buildings from that period at all. Um, so it was uh, a matter of slowly uncovering what was there to find out what was below and what was worth and what we could actually preserve. And as soon as obviously it became clear how old it was, the local conservation officers took a keen interest and were there. I think, I think they were there actually every week. Um, so we took off the render, we see the uh, wattle and daub um, and we had to be very careful. So we had to keep all these aspects as much as we possibly could. So the wattle uh, was obviously the kind of chestnut and uh, oak lats. And uh, the daub was a mixture of uh, local clay, um, which had come from the pond that was beside the property that had been there for obviously hundreds of years, uh, mixed with straw and uh, various dung and a very, a very other things. And when we took that off, when it crumbled off, we had to crumble it into basins, keep it, and then later on, we'd have to reanimate it, make it back into mud and put it back in. So this was a real lesson in conservation um, that uh, I had never experienced before. Some of the timbers, as you can see, they're very thin. Um, and uh, it soon became quite a skeleton. We put a, uh, a scaffold roof over the whole building as we got going. And you can see some parts are rotten away, but some of these timbers uh, which were so old, over 500 years old, uh, were as hard as iron and the uh, carpenters needed special tools uh, to cut them carefully where we did have to cut them. So the principle was to keep wherever we possibly could, keep and reuse, keep and move if necessary. And it was clear that some of the timbers had been moved uh, three or 400 years previously and we could see that they had been used in different places. Um, some of it looked very bad, it looked like it had been eaten away, but it was actually very strong and could be reused um, in new. And you can see there with some of the, uh, the joints that reveal some of the previous life of the building um, becoming visible. So it became a kind of a, 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 a huge puzzle. And each of the pieces that we took out, we had to lay down in a barn and they had to be, uh, we had to find a way to reuse it somewhere else as we reconfigure the building. Um, so obviously this slowed the whole project down a long, long way. We found carpenter's marks, and this was some of the uh, some of the aspects that allowed the conservation officer and one of the archaeologists to start to try and age it. Um, there were carpenter's marks. They are usually uh, Roman numerals um, that are part of a, a way for carpenters to um, take a kit of pieces and assemble it on site if they've been making them in a workshop uh, away from the site. Uh, also, they tended to mark them when they moved them. And so likewise, when we moved some of the timbers, um, we marked the timbers that were moved with the date that they were marked so that any future generations may know that they were marked. And so here's some of the, um, the new timbers going in with the old. The footings were very, very shallow, about 200 mil into the soil. And this is because as a timber building, it moved with the seasons. And so um, lighter footings allowed the building to move and flex um, through all that time. And one of the reasons I suppose why perhaps it had lasted so long because it was able to breathe that way. Some unfortunately of the timbers were rotten in the more recent times because of the cement render that had been put on. 
So this was uh, the barn to one side, and that's when, when it was finished. But that also needed a, a similar level of, uh, of attention. And so we took that and turned it into a kind of a large hall, and we inserted some pieces of it was architectural furniture into it. So it's still red as a hall, but we installed a kind of utility room and um, a, a bathroom and a bedroom and a little study on a mezzanine. Um, so again, uh, this kind of skeletal. And we wanted to reveal that kind of skeleton structure. So we put a lining of birch ply on the outside of it and then insulation outside that again. So all the, all the structure was exposed internally. And there it is when it's finished. Uh, with clay pallets and uh, keeping everything breathable. And again, those pieces of timber are very, very hard to work with, uh, the old pieces. But the new pieces were slotted in and uh, we exposed some of the dowel joints. So this is the main house when it was finished um, with the uh, I suppose more modernist extension to the right hand side. And um, it, it, it made for an interesting plan because it was very thin and narrow. Uh, so we put a timber frame extension onto the end of it, and then that was clad in oak uh, with oak uh, veneered ply on uh, the internals. So there was a kind of a quite distinct difference between the atmosphere of the new extension and the older part of the building. And that's the link piece that goes between the two. And we had to have movement joints between the new extension and the old part because the new extension, I suppose, was built reasonably conventionally with a a concrete slab and underfloor heating, and the old part was kept with its uh, brick footings, and so they the, the movement joints allow the two buildings to move separately through the seasons. We dished the oak cladding to accentuate the movement of the sun and give a certain subtlety to the shadows, so they're all screwed and pelleted. That's the inside of the uh, of the extension. We just put down a few steps as well to give a, a little bit more breathing space to the floor to ceilings. As you can imagine, a house in the 1440s has pretty low floor to ceilings, so um, it needed a little bit of relief within it. And then we used upstairs in the extension, we used uh, for a change of uh, atmosphere, we used walnut um, veneered ply as a lining. And so this project for me was quite a, I mean, okay, I was in at the deep end, but it was a fantastic experience and a great starting project for. So many other interests um, in my architectural career afterwards. We were able, encouraged, in fact, to design all the furniture by the client. Um, and so we were working with fantastic joiners, um, Crown Joinery, East Anglia, and we would draw it one week and things would literally arrive the next week. It was a fantastic feedback loop of uh, design. It really was something that I'll never forget. So, I mean, it allowed us to do, you know, bespoke little pieces on the joineries like handles. A reflecting pool to one end of the extension. And so there's uh, clay dovetiles and rebuilt um, Tudor um, chimney stacks, and then a breathable lime render with pargeting on the outside. the dining space. And the stairs, which became kind of a feature of the new and the old. It was, it was obviously there was some speculation about what might have been here originally. We didn't know. And so uh, while it's nice to try and be clear about all the new parts and the old parts being distinguished in a building like this, uh, one has to take a few leaps. So then on to uh, further interest with oak. Uh, these are three chairs that uh, we had designed and that Alan had made and that looked at three different types of oak. So this was oak that was, and this was a, this was a collaboration with Alan. This was a, a done for a craft council a weathering exhibition 2015 in London. Uh, this was oak that was ebonized and uh, I'm sure Alan knows the exact secret recipe, but as far as I'm aware, it is a, a painting on a type of rust soup onto the exposed oak and leaving it overnight. So it brings out the natural tannins within it. Um, and it's, you know, we use this quite a lot and it's actually worn really well over the last five years. Um, and then this was sandblasted, which of course reveals the actual natural grain of the oak and it's got a lovely texture uh, to it, it's really super. 
and then this is lined to select a little bit more of the natural color uh, tree. So there's three forms of oak in three chairs. Um, which leads on to the, the second house, which is a house that um, we did for my in-laws in Surrey. Um, my father-in-law is a surveyor, so he knows his buildings and uh, they lived on the site for 10 years <clears throat> in a, a kind of a, kind of a rundown uh, 18, 90 year old cottage that had been extended and extended and was set in a, a rather uh, damp hollow. And it was a house I could barely sleep in because of the damp, I uh, got asthma. And it was set within these fabulous ancient woodlands, um, Dunsfold, um, outside Guildford. It's actually close to where the Top Gear uh, test track is, and that's an airfield. But all these interconnected uh, woodlands, it's a very heavily wooded area. Um, they are actually very ancient, and they go back to Tudor times when the bridleways and pathways and public uh, uh, paths were interconnected uh, for the purposes of making uh, charcoal. The charcoal is what makes up 50% of gunpowder, and a lot of the charcoal works and gunpowder works in this area uh, were feeding the, um, the Royal Navy and the East India Company. And so uh, pastoral, though it may seem, it's actually something of an industrial landscape. And so uh, charcoal is made from oak, willow, and ash, and that's what the woods continue to be uh, in this wonderful woodland setting. So we dismantled the, uh, the existing house, um, and all the, the parts were carefully kept. Um, some of the windows went into a tree house, uh, which my father-in-law made very well. Um, that was the site office, an old 1920s uh, circus caravan. Um, worked really well. And these are the woods. And so the first step, of course, was to, his ambition was to make a, a house that suited the woods. And um, planning is obviously very strict in this part. I mean, you are allowed to replace the house 10% larger than existing, and that really is that. And so it was five planning attempts, finally in 2006. I mean, this project went on, it started, we started working on this in 2002, and it finished last year. So it was a bit of an epic. Um, but it was restricted. Um, so using local materials, his ambition was to harvest his own woods using tinnings from the woodland, woodland husbandry, and take those timbers, um, season them, and then use them within the house. Um, and these, uh, I mean, these woods, they have all sorts of uh, kind of rich connotations of, uh, of the sort of alchemy that goes with making Charcoal. So, I mean, there's uh, charcoal is lit almost literally alchemy, as in it uses earth, air, fire, and water. You take a whole load of timber, you cover it with earth, you set it on fire, and you restrict the amount of air that gets into it. And uh, you have to stay up about two nights to do it. And so, the people who do it tend to live in the woods and they kind of hallucinate because they get so tired. Because if they fall asleep and the thing goes on fire more, then they lose their whole uh, their whole stack. So it's a somewhat uh, slightly magical existence within woods, and it's still done, and there are still people who do it, um, and they have their own language, and it goes back as very ancient, kind of almost Anglo-Saxon language. Some of the, the words that go with that are things like shot, petstead, cordwood, shanklings, motty peg, clamp, uh, clinker, call. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I did get interested in the, the photography of the woods with uh, infrared photography. Uh, we made a model, uh, an intersectional model that shows some of the site. And the idea was to make a, a building that has, was surrounded by an arcade, and so it slightly blurred the inside and the outside. Uh, we were also restricted in height, that's one of the reasons for a flat roof. Um, but it was going to be, um, it was going to be clad in timber, uh, and it was going to be structurally timber as well. This was an early render, uh, another render, and a render of how it sat on the hill. Uh, a U-shaped building, which took this the, the, the light from the south, which is actually uh, at the top, north is actually bottom, um, and it sat on the side of the hill. There's a clay hill with a, a river at the bottom of it, not an easy place to access or to build upon. Um, as, in a, as I said, very restricted in terms of floor area, um, 139 square meters, so quite a tight plan. But the planners couldn't stop a basement, so there was a large basement put in underneath it, which was a, some a kind of a slightly later change of plan. And 
the structure was to be in SIPs, so structural insulated panels, and they were to be used in the basement as well within a concrete box so that it would be able to drain well. There'd be no tanking issues to deal with. The water would come through the concrete wall and then be drained away. The whole house would be nice and dry. The basement would be accessed through a kind of a, a slot. So harvesting the timber, uh, shire horses used, sensitive way of accessing woodlands, particularly on, you know, obviously it has to be done in winter. Um, it's the best time to harvest timber like this. Uh, west woodlands, clay, side of a hill. Um, using heavy machinery, you would destroy the woodland. So um, there are people who do this. It's, um, it's, it's, it's um, I suppose England is large enough to support kind of more niche trades like this. Um, the timber that were selected, max size were 600 mil. Beyond that, the, it would be too much for the horses. Um, my father-in-law, Stephen Haynes, he wanted to uh, make sure he got pieces that were 3.5 meters long so he could use them for cladding. Um, they were dragged out and then stored in a field. And then they were being sorted. Uh, considerable amount of waste obviously involved in getting good heartwood that could be used for cladding. Sapwood can't be used. And there they are, all boarded and ready for seasoning. Uh, one year for each inch of thickness is a rule of thumb. He was telling me now it's quite different for um, ash and for oak so you can see the oak in the background and that's really quite open to the elements it's gently protected the ash needs more protection that's in the foreground ash is not suitable for external use and that was being used for internal use that's how it looked after six years of aging and it's oak is famous for having life of its own it's it's strong um, you have to handle it with a certain amount of care and allow it to move so when it's used for cladding, you use oversized holes and you're allowed to move and it takes on a certain kind of unevenness. Um, a great building that is a kind of constant source of inspiration is the uh, National Maritime Museum in Falmouth, um, Kentish and Long, which is all clad in kind of six, seven different types of oak. Big hole dug, foundations put in for the basement, concrete box, and then the SIP panels arrive. So they are insulation sandwiched between two pieces of OSB. Um, we've used this on three different projects now, and it's a very good, fast way of assembling a house that's millimeter perfect and a good way of getting an airtight building um, where all the insulation is working hard. This is going to be built to code six, which is, I mean, I suppose, close to passive house standards in the UK. Um, that's where it was after three days and it was assembled in 10 days and then it was accurate enough to allow the windows to go in literally the week after which is the convenience of using SIPs. There it is. So th that insulation on the left, that huge pile of insulation, is all the insulation for the roof. Yeah, a total mountain of insulation. And then the cladding slowly came into being the years afterwards and this, this took several years to build. Um, so the, the cladding is going to be in oak and therefore all the battens need to be in oak as well. Uh, had to be sized. And then it was decided to, we kind of, we kind of uh, divided up the building into kind of modules. And there were these pilasters that divided the walls and then slightly rougher oak planking in between uh, with six mil gaps and with stainless steel uh, screws it's within uh, oversized holes. Um, and it allowed us to hide the downpipes. So you can see that in the middle of that, that's a, uh, a zinc downpipe. So that was kind of disguised as one of the oak pilasters. Uh, the oak pilasters were made out of laminated oak for the, all, all the columns and pilasters were made out of laminated oak. Took a lot of clamping as you can imagine. And then within the kind of the sunny south facing courtyard, we did a different module of oak, 50 mil strips. That's one of the, the laminated columns. And I mean, it's, hopefully these will, will last well. Um, one or two failed, but um, generally they're working well. And so you can see some of the, the detail of the cladding there at the corner. So the idea is that the building feels like it's floating and then set back from the edge of that uh, outer walkway that goes around the building is um, is the edge of the, the basement and the kind of that ventilated cavity that runs right around the basement. You can actually walk around the outside of the basement down below. Uh, we, we did the basement 
the part of the basement that's exposed is done in uh, scorched oak. Um, and Alan was talking about scorching oak earlier. And so it's, you know, that yakisugi, yakisugi Japanese type way of scorching oak. And the idea is that when it's scorched, it becomes uh, waterproof, it becomes vermin proof, it doesn't get insects, it, um, it weathers more evenly, um, it's still breathable and it gives a certain look to it. Um, obviously oak burns slower to char than say a softwood like larch. Um, quite a lot of energy involved in actually charring that much oak. So it's just done a small part in the basement. And then you pour water onto it afterwards to kind of, um, I suppose, to stabilize it. I think for furniture, you, you, can, you, you brush with wire, a wire brush and then you can seal it as well. Alan would know more about that. And there it is, a kind of a deep char to get that real richness, that almost bluey black that you get. There it is in the basement. And here it is in its, in its finished state as you approach it through the woods. Um, the idea was to, it's still a work in progress to a certain extent. The idea was that as it uh, opened up to the woods on the right hand side, it would be kept reasonably wild. And then on the left sunny side, as it faces up the hill, there'd be more of a domestic type garden on that side. So this is looking across kind of a wild uh, meadow from the woods to the west side of it. And looking up from the bottom of the hill from, from where the, the river is. So some kind of woodland planting on the north side. One of the challenges is to have the view down the, down the valley towards the river and yet have the light coming from the other side. So it faces two directions effectively. That's some of the, uh, the landscaping on the sunny south side. And then that slot that goes down to the basement down below. And the, the courtyard at the back facing the south with a different uh, pattern of oak cladding within that courtyard. We use the ash for internal joinery. Um, we did oversized doors and hidden doors. And uh, ash is a very complementary to oak, really, when it's used internally. It's hard to know the difference, to be honest. It's a slightly different figuring, different character, but it's, it's quite subtle. Um, and you can see it there on the right hand side of the hallway. So it runs seamlessly from the oak on the outside to the ash on the inside, with the hidden door set within that, and then the large door into the sitting room, and then back out to oak in the courtyard. And there it is recently, two weeks ago in the snow, in the woods. And then um, my in-laws uh, thought they'd like a swing seat to sit in the shade on summer days out of the sun. And uh, we designed a swing seat and Alan uh, very carefully made a flat pack version of this so it could be shipped over to the UK and then assembled by, by Stephen Haynes over there. And it works really well, it works really well. So there we are. Thank you very much, Stephen. So, so Alan ended up making flat pack furniture after all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, albeit a one-off. Yeah. Um, the, 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 thank you for two great presentations. Is there's something very pleasurable about looking at all that timber um, being used in all these interesting ways over the course of this hour, and we nearly are at an hour, in fact. So we we only have really about uh 10 minutes or so for 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 conversation for questions um i had i had a, a few questions but maybe just to jump in steph you had a question i, I can paraphrase if, if you like steph has a question in the chat there to say uh steph i i can read it out oh, actually go ahead yeah i was just i was just wondering um stephen you used the term architectural furniture uh when you're talking about the the first house that you're talking about and I, I'm just kind of curious what, what that means and what the difference between like furniture and architectural furniture, like what the distinction is. And I might extend the the, the question to Alan as well, to because I'd like to know if, like what Alan thinks about his work. Like, do you think you're working with furniture or architecture or architectural furniture or a combination of things or, or what the distinctions might be? Uh, OK, well, I mean, uh, sure. Thanks, Steph. I mean, particularly, I suppose, in relation to what I was talking about, were pieces of furniture that were um, made for specific rooms. 
Um, so they weren't made kind of in a generic way that could be moved for any old house. It was uh, actually made for um, specific rooms. So for example, that one there, it's, it's yeah, I was just I was just wondering, um, Stephen, you used the term architectural furniture uh, when you're talking about the, the first house that you're talking about. And I, I'm just kind of curious what, what that means, and what the difference between like furniture and architectural furniture, like what the distinction is. And I might extend the the, the question to Alan as well, to because I'd like to know if, like what Alan thinks about his work. Like, do you think you're working with furniture or architecture or architectural furniture or a combination of things or, or what the distinctions might be? Um, okay, well, I mean, uh, sure. Thanks, Steph. I mean, particularly, I suppose, in relation to what I was talking about, were pieces of furniture that were um, made for specific rooms. Um, so they weren't made kind of in a generic way that could be moved for any old house. It was uh, actually made for um, specific rooms. So, for example, that one there, it's, it's, I, it's a pity I don't have one that's further back, but it's in an attic room. And so the, the legs actually uh, match the slope of the ceiling. For example, um, and we had other pieces there that uh, I don't have my full uh, full collection of uh, photos of all, all the things that were there, but um, it, was, it was a kind of combination of fitted furniture in certain rooms with loose pieces of furniture that were meant to work with those fitted pieces of furniture. So sometimes the actual the direction of the grain went with the the, the floorboards, etc., or matched pieces that were in in, in the, the shelving and stuff like that. Alan, did you want to talk about architectural furniture? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't tend to get caught up on those things so much, but I, I think for me it would be uh, whether or not it kind of has a spatial, uh, does it, um, is there a spatial consequence to the, to the piece? So that if it affects the space or if it impacts the architecture, I think then for me, that would then be architectural. Or if I look at pieces of furniture, once they become spatial, um, say like the, the Port Leash pay, uh, mm. piece, where it's affecting how someone interacts, mm. walking across that space or interacting or how people behave, then obviously that could happen at a smaller scale with a smaller piece of furniture, but it's kind of a little bit more obvious when it's something that affects the way people congregate. So. Yeah. Do you, yeah. I, mean, I was going to ask if you thought that was a factor purely of scale and you kind of answered it there. It's not necessarily just because of the size of a thing. It's because of how it, well, it's because of how it operates spatially, to use your term. It's, just, it's, it's kind of the same thing as the door handle be, could be architecture, but like, yes, of course it could be, but. So it's, it's to do with a level of consideration. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. I, I, had a question, yeah. I had a question to, to both of you which I suppose occurred to me as you were both talking with such great passion and deep knowledge of your, of really of material, let's say in the first instance of the material you're working with, the timber, oak particularly. How do you, how do you get to be like that? Um, I mean, my question is really motivated by the fact that I'm, I don't feel that I am, or I don't feel, I don't feel I possess a deep knowledge of a, no, I'm not in practice very much, but, um, I, I'm not one of those people who, who kind of is really invested in and, and deeply knowledgeable about a particular material and how it behaves. And, 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 I, and I, I'm wondering, is it a sort of an open church, this church of um, passion for materials, or does it tend to be that you either know or you don't? How do you come to know? How do you, how do you start to become more knowledgeable? Is it by working with it? Is it by... Uh, talking to other people, talking to people, who, who, you know, who were uh, in, involved in craft. Can you talk a bit about that? I mean, from my own angle, uh, it's, 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 it's boats. Uh, I sail um, wooden boats. And so with wooden boats, you have to paint them. Um, I suppose paint them every year, but probably every two years, three years. And um, so it means really sanding down the boats and a lot of varnishing. And um, uh, I've uh, made or helped make a few boats. And um, you know, for example, for oak, I mean, you, you there's a fantastic way of making uh, uh, oak ribs. You let it waterlog for about six months until it doesn't float, and then you um, you uh, you put it into a, a a downpipe and you steam it. And then when it's still hot, like hot to touch, you're wearing gloves. You bend it into a boat and you uh, you fasten it with copper, 
nails and um so for me I, I suppose my hands have been on timber and i like making things so um that's my interest in, in timber um, yeah I, th I think for me um like the wood turning was something i would have done growing up and there's there's the, the irish wood turners guild which is a hobby organization which i would have not, not so much lately but maybe 10 15 years ago i was quite involved with and they were workshops that were organized by local local groups and you could go along and learn about how to make a particular thing and that was a group of people who were really passionate about that particular skill who were meeting up to discuss their ideas in a very open way purely mostly as a hobby it was these people most people had jobs and it was something they did at the weekend or they were a lot of retired people pick it up maybe like engineers or people who are you know in their working lives were quite active and involved in making things and design of you know very functional maybe work but when they retired then that filled that void of curiosity and they got really really into it and there was a lot of knowledge there that then when i came into these meetings i was able to really you know get all their their knowledge about working you know on a very usually on a small scale with wood but how to use tools and i would say that was very you know, very useful for me in terms of learning about wood and materials and the way you can do different things, different materials, how to use wet timber, all those sort of things. And um, that, that's definitely one outlet amongst other other uh, ways that I would have got information. Can I go to the other end of the the scale, if you like? And I'm just thinking about Ireland. I'm thinking about Ireland and um, the extent of timber building or work with timber, which. Traditionally, has it's been seen that there hasn't been that much um, building in timber. I would imagine. I think it would be fair to say it's increasing. But how do you see the future of timber construction and making with timber in Ireland? Do you think we're we need to do things differently? We can do things more. Do you think we need to be planting different kinds of uh, trees, harvesting in different ways? Or how how do how do you see it? Uh, well, from my angle, uh, I mean we've done quite a few timber frame buildings and there's still a suspicion against us um, there's still even problems getting insurance mm. for timber frame buildings that you're limited to certain insurance companies who will do it which is really unfortunate it's considered a non-standard building method um, mm. the timber available to make uh, timber frames you know some of it does come from ireland a lot of it doesn't uh, a lot of irish timber harvesting unfortunately goes for kind of pulp and lesser use of timber um hardwoods there's really quite a limited amount of useful hardwoods i mean that you know for example my father-in-law was very lucky to have pieces of timber that were actually straight and branch free <clears throat> and of a minimum dimension to be able to use it usefully yeah. um, that's because he had an ancient woodland and there are very few of those in ireland that are regularly harvesting um so uh, we don't have that kind of that ancient history, uh, not for a few hundred years at least. I mean, I remember when I was at school, our forest cover in Ireland was down to four percent. I remember, I remember from geography, it was the lowest percentage in Europe by a long, long way. Mm. And obviously, as many protests have uh, come up lately about the monoculture of a type of the deadening effect of having one mm. type of softwood planted in places like Leitrim, where no life in these very, very dark forests. Yeah. Uh, there's always been this commitment to having uh, hardwoods around the edge of softwood plantings, but as far as I can see, they're never quite the percentage that they should be. So I don't think we're putting down what we need to for the future. That would be my view. I wonder, is it also <clears throat> to do with, um, I guess, well, not so much manufacturing, but the whole supply chains and how they work and so on. I remember Merritt saying to me or telling me, I was going to say recently, it may not be that recently, he's, he's doing a large building in Toronto and they're getting all the timber from Norway. Hmm. And you're sort of thinking, I would have thought Canada had timber, you know, yeah. or at least room for timber, if yeah. not timber. Um, but it's obviously, I think it's just to do with the, what they need and where they can get it yeah. within the time frame, et cetera. You know what I mean? So that there's when there's a really evolved industry, that's where you tend to go and maybe it's actually tends to preclude industries in emerging elsewhere you know i, I don't know I don't that, know. You, yeah like I, where you got the big chunks the big chunk yeah well, a, a lot of that say from all the states irish estates um will have some irish um uh, oak so they have a, say oak uh, hardwoods 
Um, but that's that's very limited. Um, there's one particular sawmill which is quite close to me, which he, he tends to be able to get with these big sections of oak. And there's probably not very many sawmills like that in the country. There's no facilities for drying oak or drying hardwoods really. So there's no network does it of even on <clears throat> for the for the material that's available. If there was a, a sawmill network and a kill and drying network um, to you to be able to utilize that material, even what exists, which it, that, that doesn't exist. And then beyond that, obviously the main problem is there isn't enough of the of the material because um, it hasn't been planted. It's still not being planted. That's probably a policy issue, a land ownership issue. So mm -hmm. that's a very, very difficult thing to solve. And yeah. policy is probably the, the only way of getting around that. Mm -hmm. um, people are just set in their ways in terms of... Um, There's an interesting yeah. historical note on this as well. I know that in, um, at the time of the War of Independence, when a lot of large country houses were being burnt out by the IRA and some of the residents were taking shelter in other places and left their estates um, for a few months during the troubles at that time, the first thing that were taken were the trees. Hmm. And the, the Free State directly after compensated those landowners for the loss of their trees. Trees. Yeah. Mm. 